Hello, I am Harry Louisiz. I am a high school math teacher on Long Island. And, uh, Adam and I are... Where was the cheering for New Hampshire? Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, that's fine. Uh, Adam and I are also co-teachers at the same school, so that's a fun little cool dynamic. Uh, I'm also the managing editor for 6-1 Indie, which is an indie uh, game website that amplifies indie voices, so smaller games that uh, might be niche or might be smaller that uh, can get a lot of excitement and uh, amplify notoriety by just us talking about it and showing how awesome they are. We've actually done a showcase, so if you want to check it out on youtube.com slash 61 indie, be sure to check it out. Um, it's really cool games, so be sure to have some fun with that. Um, I've also gotten the award as a 10 under 10 young alumni from Adelphi University, which is an award that um, an alumni committee denotes to 10 young alumni every year for their exceptional work in the community and in their careers. So my main focus when I won it a few years ago was for uh, my volunteerism for my fraternity Cap Sigma, as well as my uh, game-based and community service actions at my high school that I won it. And then I also have gotten uh, several grants and um, awards and monetary items for game-based and gamification items in my classroom. So uh, I was able to purchase a bunch of Spheros, which are small spherical robots that students can easily program um, either with HTML, um, block coding, or just using your finger for younger students to kind of just get them into the uh, mindset of coding and building up to that. And yeah, that's it. If you just came in, welcome, but we will need to see a pass from your previous <laughs> setting. That's not true. We're happy to have you. Okay, so turn and talk time. Who knows what this is? You don't actually have to raise your hand, but um, we love games because we love Bloom's Taxonomy, which if you were a teacher, you know what that is, and it's the idea that knowing content is really important, but it's the foundation, and that when you continue to work on how to comprehend, apply, analyze, synthesize, and evaluate the information you know, you are a more effective learner and thinker. And so here are, we're, we're thinking about all those things as we're talking to you about games, and we're gonna start with the basics, which is content knowledge. And you can use games to teach content. Do you, does somebody wanna tell a little bit about one of the games they use? Uh, sure. So one of the games, I, I'll talk about two games. One of the games I use in my English language arts class is What Remains of Edith Finch, right up there in the middle. Um, have any of you who's out there played What Remains of Edith Finch? Okay, if your hand's not up, that's your homework. Okay, <laughs> you play it. It's one of the best games of the past, like, decade. Um, and it's a super accessible game to, like, kind of start with, because it's just a walking simulator. The controls are not too complicated or demanding. Mm -hmm. And I use it to teach basically the same content that students are learning in almost any high school English language arts class, which is literary elements and rhetorical devices, like complex point of view, characterization, setting, mood, tone, plot, all of that. Um, except instead of reading a book, we were just playing the game together as a class. So the exact same skills um, found in any classroom, but we played it, and then they would discuss and analyze what was happening on screen. Um, and usually when I use games, I'm, we're playing together in class because buying dirty computers and copies of games is not really feasible for any teacher. So usually I just bring in my personal console or, or my personal laptop and we just play together. Um, a game that is not up there that I have used is um, Paper Squeeze. When I, every other year I teach US history and Paper Squeeze is about immigration and refugee crises. And it's basically a puzzle game at heart where you are put in the role of a border patrol agent looking at the documentation of incoming refugees and immigrants, and you need to decide if they are allowed to come in based on the documentation that they provide you. And you stamp yes or no. And my school is a 100% immigrant population. And it is very interesting to see how they interact at, in this role in the game, because some of them are super, super empathetic, and they're like, oh yeah, you come in, no problem, you don't have papers, no problem, come on in, come on in. And then about half of my students are like, nope, it took me 10 years to finally get approval to come, and they're just rejecting everyone. 
And then you have a debate, a class debate about what those choices that they were making. So anytime I'm teaching about immigration and refugee crises, whether it's US history or global history, I'm always playing this game with my class. And we really only play for about 45 minutes. You don't need to play the entire nine hours. Um, so it's also super easy game because the controls are not too demanding as well. Uh, I have words of water deep up there, and those of you that have played that loop are probably sitting there like, oh, so he doesn't know what content is. <laughs> so I'm a global history teacher for ninth and 10th grade students, and again, I'm a special education teacher, and one of the things that we struggle with most in the New York curriculum is uh, getting students to understand how to connect to enduring issues. You know, taking content and connecting it to these larger things that we still struggle with today, like conflict, interconnectedness, scarcity. And a game like Lord of Waterdeep is perfect for that because it's rooted in fantasy, but all of those concepts come into play. So you know, you're having to manage your resources, you're dealing with scarcity, you're watching as the decisions of others impact what you can and cannot do. Um, and at the end of a game like that, to be able to discuss with the students, like, okay, what did you see there that connects to the larger content that we've been discussing? Um, is something that allows them to have fun, but then connect to the larger issues that they're seeing. I mean, you're talking ninth graders, you're talking ancient history. It's not something they really care about too much. <laughs> But if you can connect it through the bigger themes through a game like this, it's a win-win. So I'm going to focus on the, the math and the STEM part of the content. So my favorite example that I usually do is uh, when I taught algebra, I would always show the students this gif of Mario jumping from Super Mario Brothers. Um, we did a what do you think, what do you wonder, uh, and eventually they noticed that Mario, when he jumps, he goes up, and then he goes down. Uh, what I did with that gif is I froze it, I um, spliced it up into all the photos, and then had the students plot the points related to time versus height. Um, so eventually, they noticed that it becomes a parabolic regression, so parabola, which is one of the key things that they need to understand in uh, algebra for their state assessments and for overall understanding um, on the building blocks for higher math and content. So connecting it directly to something that we're going to have to learn anyway gives them a point of reference so that I can refer back to this example as a warm-up. Something that doesn't need to take three weeks or two days, it's just a warm-up for 10 or 15 minutes to get them thinking about the math so that they are starting to get engaged and invested into the understanding of learning the math. Because all the time we're going to hear, when am I ever going to use this? And we're going to talk about that in a few seconds. Um, and that's always a tough cornerstone to break, but at least showing these examples with content helps bridge that gap with the students. Yeah, I would teach an ancient warfare class, and that's with the extremely realistic siege warfare simulator. This is a spoiler alert, but it is actually not realistic. That's a joke. And so it makes it perfect for fifth and sixth graders who are bloodthirsty but do not actually want to see blood. And in a few minutes, I can show them the value of cavalry or archers or not sending everyone headlong you know, into the fray at once in a way that I can explain forever, but if they can see it visually played out, it takes a few minutes to sort of help them get to that next level of understanding. And the one other example I want to bring up is Cell to Singularity, which is a mobile and PC game where you literally build the tree of life through um, one of those games that you kind of have to wait to get resources, so you check it like once or twice a day to get resources, build it out, uh, and then eventually see all the strands become animals, and then all the animals become all the evolutions of them throughout the um, millennium of Earth. Um, what I thought was really cool is it's all scientifically accurate with types of information, with the time frame of everything, of what animals came first and what came second, and what's the most recent one. Um, and they also create expansions that focus on um, dinosaurs with all those eras, as well as the solar system uh, expansion that you can jump into after you hit a certain point. And something like this could be beneficial for uh, astronomy classes, biology classes, um, 
something with humans with evolution to kind of give students a, a, a touchstone so that when you talk about all the different types of dinosaurs, they'll be able to have some sort of reference with the game. Um, takes two or three minutes to play each day, have it as your warm up, and then have the students kind of debrief on it, which I think can be beneficial to hook the students on what is the thing that they're learning. And the last one up here is Inspired, which you'll all just have to come down to Pax Unplug, and then you can see a whole panel about it in December. But Inspired is an RPG where all the magic is American Sign Language, or British Sign Language, because it was originally made in England. And um, I'm currently doing research with my class right now on its efficacy, but it's also a lot of fun and this really different way of thinking about language acquisition. I think it could be done with other languages as well, but it's really great and you should check it out. So here's the big one. You teach middle school or high school too, I imagine, is when am I ever going to use this? When you are 12 years old, it feels like a lot of what you do in school is irrelevant to your future. Um, and probably some of it is, but working within the game, it allows an immediacy for the use of the content and the skills, right? If you can't find a real reason to use it right now, we can make up a reason that is more entertaining and engaging. So we have a couple different things here. Uh, what's this game of life? Best board game ever made. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, right? So, who here had actually had a personal finance class in middle school or high school? Okay. Okay, that's a little bit. Right? Yeah, but that's always one of the main complaints. Like, oh, they should teach personal finance in school. I'm like, fine. So this year I'm teaching personal finance in my econ class. And I wanted that to not be boring because kids don't often care about personal finance yet. So as a, a, we do capstone projects in my school where they have to write this big paper and do a whole presentation about it. And it's one of their graduation requirements. So in, for our personal finance project, I had them play the game of life, and then they had to explain all the decisions that they made and why they made those decisions, and then they had to critique the game and explain different ways that they would alter the game to make it actually more true to real life. So they actually had to go doing research as to what the actual cost of the things that they're doing in the game would be where they currently live. As a fun fact, the version of the game we played, I don't know if it's like this in the original version, but in this game, Every baby that you have, they give you 50 grand at the end of the game. So this game, this one's actively encouraging all of us to have as many children as possible. So my students all had like 10 kids by the end of the game. And for many of them, that was one of the things that they actually went and researched. Okay, what's the cost of the child of a child, or what's the cost of having two or three kids, right? So they would actually compare the decisions that they made in the game to things that they are probably going to be doing in real life. Well, some of them are doing in real life because I teach high school seniors, and some of them are parents, right? And a lot of them are going to college next year. They're debating, do I really want to take out loans to go to college, or should I start a career now and then go to college later, right? So all, even though the game is silly, and it's not realistic at all, it at least got them thinking about real life decisions in a fun way that they, they then actually went and wrote a six page research paper about and gave a full presentation for. So highly recommend for anyone who's thinking about teaching personal finance. And this uh, Game of Life lesson that Zach was talking about is also on HeyListenGames.com. Uh, what he doesn't know is I am also going to play the, life, uh, the Game of Life next week with my students uh, using most of what Zach already made. But my modification in my business math class, which is mostly life skills, similar to what Zach was saying, is comparing the year that the game was made versus the current year and checking out the minimum wage, the inflation, like what's accurate, what's not accurate, kind of giving it more of a mathematical reference point. Um, maybe instead you, of maybe you want to put that curriculum on Hayless and Games also. Oh, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, everyone here can hide it too. Yeah. <laughs> that's Should that's I move? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I just wanted to bring that up because it's, it's, it's not a bad thing to keep learning. So. Always keep trying something new. And we're going to talk about it more in detail, but I just wanted to keep, we're, keep, we're even learning from each other, so it's not a bad thing to keep trying to find new things. So you can see here, um, 
I teach enrichment, so I have all the kids who are a square peg in a round hole. And that's every, I have a special ed certification and I teach the whole range of kids. Uh, so it's not just gifted and talented. Uh, and one of the things I have been teaching this year is a little bit of a hands-on biology intro class. Because they don't teach all the body systems anymore, just the reproductive system in health, which is everyone's least favorite slash most favorite day in middle school in their career. We had it last week. There are a lot of penises being drawn everywhere. Everyone's processing at their own speed. Um, so, so I don't have to teach about that, but one of the things I do want them to understand is about blood typing. And if you tell a kid you're going to learn about different types of blood, but then they don't see any blood, again, it's the bloodthirsty thing, they're not that interested. And so suddenly, once I've taught them a little bit about it, they come in and there's a crime scene. There's like all these cookies on the floor and broken pottery. And I say, okay, well, someone stole all the, these cookies were for you. And someone stole them. And then everyone is, you know, horrified. And we break up into groups and each group is trying to get the government contract to be the one who, you know, identifies the thief, and we have some fake blood here, and you can get it from Bio uh, Carolina Biological Supply Company. It's not very expensive. And now they, it matters if they get it right, because A, they want cookies, and B, they want to be able to lord it over everybody else in the class. So which one of these puppets was the thief? You have to find out by taking blood samples, comparing them against the samples that were taken from the puppets, I guess. And, uh, and then whoever gets it right gets cookies. And so this is immediately, A, something that you are not allowed to tell the wellness committee you do, and secondly, <laughs> something that automatically makes them more interested in blood typing. So what do I see up here at the top? It looks like some Pokemon. It is. So one of my favorite video game franchises is Pokemon, so yay for that. <laughs> So last year I taught a game theory class which focused on um, game strategies, uh, analysis, and then synthesis of those um, strategies to applications of games that they play all the time that they might not have realized. Uh, so one of the projects I did after we talked about probability was allowing students' choices to uh, pick a video game that they like or they play or they enjoy and do a deep dive analysis on some sort of probability aspect of the game. So whether it's Pokemon where, and this is all simplified versions, because I know Pokemon's attack and defense gets very deep. Um, but if an attack has a 70% chance of a successful hit like Thunder, what is the probability that it'll hit exactly three times? Uh, two out of five times? Um, no more than three times? What if there's a status effect and it lowers it by 15%? How is that going to impact it? Um, and students were really creative with the games that they chose. Not everyone chose video games, which is fine. Um, some of them chose tabletop games or um, like tic-tac-toe or other simplified games um, to meet their learning needs and understanding. But it was really exciting that a lot of students were choosing games that I've never heard of or I didn't know that they play, and we had nice conversations on that. Um, this is when Genshin Impact came out, so that was a big swell for my 25 students that were playing that. Um, and they, we also did a discussion on why some games don't explicitly show the probabilities of certain things, or if it's a gotcha game like Fire Emblem Heroes, or games that you have to pay and then the probability changes. Um, having those discussions with what's happening with gotcha games or probability or um, like pay to win games kind of sparked this whole conversation. And then students compare just to make sure that these and, uh, the examples and descriptions are accurate. So they were kind of pushing and pulling back on each other, be like, all right, well, how do you know that this is prop, like, this is accurate? Um, and then they kind of did a breakdown and kind of almost had to defend their explanations with it. Um, so it got students engaged in a different way with probabilities. If I just say, what's the probability it's going to rain on Tuesday? And then you get crickets, like, this has much of that So finding a way to hook it with something that I already like and blending it with the content that I need to present to them is always a benefit. So one of the things we love about games is that it automatically involves problem solving. 
So we're already taking any kind of content we're using. We're starting to use some of our higher order thinking skills. We have lots of different ideas here of ways um, that you can use problem solving even when you're not knowing that you are. So tell me a little bit about some of these games, guys. So Carcassonne, again, is a, uh, as an approach to problem solving and decision making for students and across the board is going to be something that's, that's helpful for them. Uh, for special education students in particular though, uh, where they have gone through their lives and their education with uh, a lot of times a limited sense of agency uh, without the ability to make the choices that other students oftentimes are allowed to make. A game like this not only gives them the ability to make those choices, but also shows them the consequences of their actions. Um, and as you know, my, my panel mates up here have said, it's another game that you don't have to play all the way through all at once. You know, it's, it's something you can have set up uh, and play as, a, as, an, as an opener or as a closer uh, and allow students to find their way through these larger problems while also experiencing an increasing sense of agency. Thank you. I'm gonna talk again, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna kind of do a little bit rapid fire because I have a lot on this slide, but uh, Guess Who is another probability-oriented game that I focused on. Uh, also with uh, binary decisions, when I spoke about that in my class with the yes or no. So uh, is that person with uh, wearing a hat? Yes or no. Is that, are their cheeks, cheeks rosy? Yes or no. Are they, do they have a mustache? Yes or no. Uh, and then letting the kids play that once or twice, because a lot of them have not played Guess Who, which kind of boggles my mind. Which is fine, um, but that was something I wasn't expecting, so we spent a day playing the game so that he understood the mechanics of it. And then the next day, they played it, but they had to narrow it down through probability. Like, what is the most optimal way to play this game? Uh, is it go for broke and choose very specific questions, or is it be general, narrow it down by halves, and constantly get exponential regression that way? Well, and I want to say that in doing inspirals and teaching American Sign Language, by the end of the quarter, we can play Guess Who very simply, you know, is, and we play it with, with toys. And we say, is your toy red? Is your toy big? Mm -hmm. Right? And, and so I think with language learning, it's also really great. Um, in science, I've done a version of this with genetics Guess Who, where we have to say, like, is this person's phenotype the dominant phenotype, or what for a hand, or something like that. So I think that sort of guessing is through binary decision making can be used in a lot of different ways, and it's really simple to make. Yeah, it's very malleable guessing. So, and it's usually cheap and on sale. So, that's a fun bonus. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up is Dungeons and Dragons. So, Adam and I play Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but one of the things that I focused on with one of my units, which is usually super dry and not exciting, is coordinate geometry, where students plot points and have to tell me stuff about it. So whether it's the distance of a line segment, whether what, what's the midpoint, what's the radius, what's the area within the radius, it goes on and on, which is, for me, very exciting in the math teacher. But for students, they're like, oh my god, Mr. L, like, why are we doing this? Uh, so usually what I do is, uh, once they have the foundation of like plotting points, graphing, maybe the like distance formula, um, then I can immediately go into word problems, which is at first red flags are like, what are you doing, Mr. L? Um, but it's contextualizing the scenario. So let's just say points A, B, and C. I don't call them A, B, and C, but I call them like Alex, Bob, and uh, Kitty Cat are seeing a giant monster 40 meters away. If they have to be outside the radius of 30 feet, what is their optimal path? So then they have to figure out, okay, I have to do the distance formula, I gotta make sure that they're all within the same distance, so maybe figure out the radius or the equation of the circle, and kind of make it into a compound question, which prepares them for their assessments at the end of the year, which is the same thing, only not as cool written, coolly written. It's much more like boring. But getting them hooked on the exciting versions will help them understand the math material and then can apply it to the ones that might be less exciting on the assessments. Additionally, with circles, because most of geometry is circles and triangles, um, is League of Legends, which I was kind of shocked that so many students were playing it last year. Um, 
just because I didn't think 16, 17 years were playing that. But a lot of them were into it. So we talked about radius and area of effect, bringing it back to circles and uh, area and plotting points. So this attack right here, what is the angle of measure? So like, they would have to figure out the circumference, the areas of each point, and then kind of show like, this is how much space it's occupying for this attack. Is it beneficial? Is it not beneficial? Will it attack my, um, I'm losing my word. Teammates, sorry, that was a long call, I'm sorry. We were all wondering. Yeah, I'm like, oh my god. Maybe he's saying? playing a game with you. Right? Well, I, 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 I was thinking to engage your curiosity. Probably. Yeah, I, I was thinking comrades, but I'm like, what is the other word? <laughs> yeah, don't say that too loud. You're going to get arrested. Yeah. Congratulations, you're all communists. <laughs> yeah, someone's going to think you're teaching critical race theory yeah. if you say comrades. Yeah. In New Hampshire. If you catch me teaching critical race theory, you can get $500 and I can get arrested. It's an interesting time. Vote. <laughs> anyway, redirection. <laughs> so the last thing I want to bring up uh, sorry, uh, is breakout EDU, which is essentially an escape room, but in a classroom. Uh, before COVID, most of what I did with these is physical, where it's a literal box, and there's uh, locks either with numbers, with colors, or with symbols that students need to kind of decipher a, a problem or a scenario or a situation that gives them the clue. Most of the time, they're all math related, so they're pretty much doing a review for any of the concepts, but instead of being a horribly boring handout, it's an engaging activity that's still practicing the same contents, the same level of rigor, the same quality and quantity of questions, but in a different way. I will say though, those are a lot of prep. So what we did during COVID to kind of adjust it was make it uh, a more digital situation, either with Google Forms, still the same questions, still the same level of rigor, rigor but on a more digital platform. There is a paid subscription. I would suggest you use some Google finessing and find some free stuff. But, or even just creating your own simple problems to kind of branch it out to see if the students are engaged with it, if they're successful with it, whether you want to expand it further. And if you're interested in breakout EDU, you, you don't know about it, they do offer modules for global history and U.S. history as well. Um, I do want to note, panelists, that we have spent half of our time, so we might want to pick up the pace a little bit. We gotta get in that, you know, end exit ticket before everybody leaves. All right, uh, so let's talk about game development. So this year, for the first time, I started dabbling in teaching an elective class in game development. And what I recommend every teacher do is to look into Epic Games, because they will provide you with tons and tons and tons of curriculum already made for using their gaming tech, specifically Fortnite Creative, Twin Motion, and Unreal Engine. I also recommend looking into the Epic Secondary Educator Acceleration Program, because they do it a couple times a year, and they pay me $2,000 to learn how to use their tech to teach to my students over the, over the previous summer. So, I started out using their, currently, this is my class literally right now, and teaching them how to use Twin Motion at the moment. Twin Motion is basically a stripped down version of Unreal Engine. It's actually, it actually is Unreal Engine, but it's just very simplified. And it's typically used for architecture, right? But it's the same general concept. So these pictures are all designing their own homes, they're looking for 3D models online, they're downloading them, then they're modifying them, they're bringing in 3D assets, and fun. everything's free, except the computers themselves, which my principal generously provided for me this year, very cool. Um, so they're using all free, and Twin Motion's free to use if you're a teacher, so it's all free software, all free assets, and they're just learning how to, right now, create their own homes. But it doesn't need to just be homes, you, right? There's tons of lessons already made through Epic Games, like how to create, like, a car, or a bedroom, or a park, right? But this is like a really great way to get them introduced to the tech, because like gaming tech in general is just exploding. Like, beyond even just the gaming industry, it's being used everywhere. At this point, if you're watching The Mandalorian, a lot of that is made from Unreal Engine, those special effects. Right, and once, I'm per we're, I assume a number of us are on our spring break, coming back on Monday, some students have already finished their work with Twin Motion, so the ones who are ready are now gonna jump into 
using Unreal Engine and actually making their own games. Twin Motion's not really a game, you can walk around, but it's first person and that's pretty much the extent of it. Unreal Engine, you can do pretty much whatever you want. So I'm gonna have students start creating like a third person game where they actually have characters and can go run around. And I'm pretty much just gonna give them freedom to do whatever they want. I'm just gonna send them to Epic Games' website and let them choose the actual thing that they want to build. So I don't even need to make the curriculum. It's all already made and they have the freedom to design whatever they want. So I highly recommend you all to look into that if that's possible. And it doesn't need to be its own class. Last year, uh, I was teaching US history, specifically New York City history, and I was teaching about Seneca Village, which was an African American village that was destroyed in order to create Central Park. And I had some students design it in Fortnite Creator. So they actually use the assets in Fortnite to create what they think the village would have looked like based on descriptions from newspapers and the few images that there are. So there are a lot of cool ways to use this tech in your classes already. That's it. So, um, really quickly, um, sort of going back to what you were talking about about probability, so I'm teaching an intro to probability with some of my students. And again, probability is, if, if you teach probability, this is the low hanging fruit of math as a game, right? Many games are probability based. So, uh, one group of kids had to design games. <clears throat> they had to be honest about the probability of winning, and the harder it was to win, the more the prize was. All of the fifth graders <clears throat> got 10 tickets to come in. Each game cost one ticket to win. They're trying to come out with the biggest profit from the casino. The casino is trying to make the most profit, and then the another class of kids that I had who are really struggling with probability concepts uh, came and got to evaluate. So they were now in a role of teachers that had to go through the rubric and say, like, how did these meet all of these criteria? And so again, it was really creative. It allows kids to problem solve and think about it in different ways. Uh, <clears throat> this one on the lower right, this is the key, ready? You gotta be able to have more than one person play at once and have the game be really fast. And that's what this person in the bottom figured out and made way the most amount of tickets. Although the child on the left with the giant mustache was a close second because everyone loved the mustache. <laughs> so another thing that um, we talk about a lot in middle and high school is executive functioning. Executive functioning is the thing that gets you to the place where you're supposed to be on time, helps you regulate your emotions, helps you work with other people, and remember where your phone is. <coughs> Some of us do better at that than others. Uh, <clears throat> so well, there's a bunch of different games here that can help you with some of those executive functioning challenges. Um, what's this one on the bottom with labs? That's uh, Catch the Moon, which uh, I first saw at Hackman Club. Oh, no, it's been like 2019? Yeah, three years ago. It's been a while. Uh, and they actually just re are re-upping on it, so it's, it, I think it's available for pre-order right now. Uh, a great, great exec executive functioning game, especially if a student is somebody who, folk who is struggling with um, fine motor skills. Uh, this is a game where they have to roll a die and then place a ladder on the previously placed ladders, either to make it the, the tallest part of the structure or to touch a certain amount of the ladders. Uh, it's a game that's exceptionally hard for me, even at almost 40, because my hands shake. But that's because I'm a teacher who drinks a lot of coffee. Uh, for students in a population like I teach, this is something that, again, teaches them patience. It allows them to practice turn-taking. It allows them to practice, uh, you know, viewing a problem from many different angles. Uh, and it can be exceptionally helpful for them. I don't know, but it makes me want to catch the moon. Bring it back. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. So one of the things that I like to do is not be in front of everyone talking at them, uh, which makes this sort of style of panel really weird because that's not really the kind of teachers we are. Uh, so I taught a photography class and in the end, this is sort of a long story so I'll keep it brief, but they were aliens 
coming to Earth and taking pictures of things on Earth to send back so that everyone would move to Earth because their planet was going to get destroyed. And so there was some urgency. And so if you look at the bottom, this is a uh, flying saucer. And each one of these represents a little bay of people who are getting onto the flying saucer to come to Earth. And once it's filled up, they come and you win. And everyone lives. And it's exciting. So these are all the different kinds of subject matter that they could use. Once they, as a group, figured out what their subject matter was and took the pictures, they had to email them to me with a description of the kind of uh, photographic um, things that they used to do it, all the different skill sets. This is literally a pie chart of how much work you did in the class and a list of things you can do. That's it. And so the amount of, uh, other than setting it up, my job is to keep the shit and the conceit of the game alive. And the kids are doing all the rest of the work. But now they have urgency, they have creativity as they go through. They're coloring in little bays, and I'm like, oh, look, you did color. Now all of the artists of the whole community have come in because they know there's color on Earth. Oh, wow. Um, you know, all of the teenagers are there now because they can see there's lots of opposites if they want to be oppositional. Um, or whatever. And they're really excited to do that, right? And there's a, a timeline before the end of the class. But all this really is is thinking about the work that we have to do anyway in a slightly different way. That's, and that's a lot of what using games in the classroom is about, is taking the work that we need to do anyway and thinking, how can I engage their curiosity and urgency and teamwork? Especially when some of the things that you're, you're trying to do with the students are beyond content. Uh, again, you know, a, a game like Werewolf, uh, which we used here because we didn't feel comfortable putting a secret Hitler, uh, <laughs> is a game. I mean, you already said comments. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bring it up. <laughs> uh, but a game like that can, can help students with autism to be able to begin to better experience reading social situations, figuring out facial uh, expression. Uh, as they you know, go through the room, they, they're interviewing people and they're, they're trying to understand the roles that people are playing and are they being truthful. These are things they struggle with in their everyday life already. And this gives them an opportunity to do it and to experiment with a safety net. Um, where, yes, there's a winner and a loser, but you're not losing a friend if you mess it up. You're not, your parents aren't yelling at you if you mess it up. You have a chance to practice these skills in, in a supportive environment that can really help them. So collaboration is another really important skill that we work on in middle and high school and all of our lives, really. And this is one of the most important parts of games, right? As teachers, we understand that knowledge and content is on that very bottom of the blue taxonomy. We have to get these people ready to go be in the big world and have all sorts of good pro-social skills to help them be successful human beings. And collaboration is certainly one of them. Headbands is a really simple one, uh, where you wear a headband and put something on your head and the other person has to tell you what it is without saying, it's kind of like taboo. Uh, and you can use that with content, you can use that with basically anything you want. Um, and it's, that's a very simple one that can be, it's, it's a lot like get to in the fact that it's very malleable. If you're looking for a uh a way to introduce RPGs or D&D to, to kids you can use the Adventure Begins set. Um, this again allows students to begin to understand character creation, you know, the powers that the, the different characters have, but also how they can interact their characters with the characters of others, uh, with the goal being that we all win or we all lose. Um, you know, very, very quick playthrough, definitely doable in the classroom. A, a great way to introduce RPGs. The dark picture, you probably can't see anything in the top right. That's my classroom from 
two years ago now, just kind of probably, probably like right before COVID shut everything down. Um, I believe they're playing Edith Finch in that picture, but like the idea with video games is definitely don't shy away playing together as a class. Um, you don't, not everyone needs to have their own copy of the game. Any teacher who's ever shown a movie did not provide a movie to every single student, right? You watch it together as a class and then you discuss what's happening together as a class. And not everyone actually wants to be the player. Like, we all, most of us probably watch streams and YouTube videos, right? So plenty of us are already happy watching video games. A lot of our students are the same way. Um, so not everyone actually, not everyone wants to actually play, especially in front of other people, right? So play together as a class. Um, and then, especially for games, this year I played Life is Strange 2 with my students. And in games like that, let them vote on those big decisions that you're making, right? And to see what's going to happen. And if you do have the opportunity to have maybe like play in groups, like I do have five computers in my room, so I could have them work in groups and then they can make their own decisions and they can compare and contrast how the story actually altered. If you are playing decision based games, um, but definitely don't shy away from like, working together as a class. I know that can get harder as classes get into like 30 to 35 students. I've been lucky that my classes hover around 20 to 25, so it's never too unmanageable on my end. Real quick, uh, We're Doomed is a 10 minute game where each player uh, is a type of government. So oligarchy, democracy, I'll, I'll talk about these. Theocracy. Say it. I'm not going to. No. Say it. I'm not saying the word. No. 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 I don't know. Uh, but it's a ten-minute game where you're one of those uh, types of government, and you have each of uh, a characteristic that blends with that type of um, type of government. So if you're a theocracy, you might have more uh, religious coins or more. Um, special powers that relate to that specific thing. However, since it's the end of the world and some bad thing's about to happen, since it's called We're Doomed, um, you either have to collaborate with uh, your other players to try and work together to get off Earth into a spaceship, or say, screw y'all, I'm gonna jump ship and go over to the moon. Um, so it's a really intense, fast-paced game where they have to make decisions quickly and have to either collaborate or fall apart and see the world in be doomed. Also, Wordle. Most of us are playing it. I play it every day with my third period resource room class. And if we, you know, it gets to the end of the quarter, and I'm like, hey guys, we got, you know, we got other things we got to take care of to get you ready for the end of the quarter. They're like, whatever you do, do not skip Wordle. <laughs> Start with donut. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Um, we are having to pick the pace up a little bit. Games do a lot of good stuff for you. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's awesome and important. Yeah. Uh, we already covered a lot of this, but you know, in terms of those larger skills that, the, that using games in the classroom can help students with, obviously communication skills, Zach spoke for that so eloquently. Uh, cause and effect recognition, again, you know, something that in the social, stu in the social, social studies world, uh, we try and show them through history, but we also need them to see in their own lives. Pattern recognition, um, I already spoke about enduring issues and seeing content and themes. Generalization, uh, especially for special education populations, is something that they struggle with mightily. You know, learning a skill in one area and being able to apply it in a different er in a different content, a, di a new. Um, I lost it. Inference: What I was saying. <laughs> this skill. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. Again, from a special education standpoint, uh, the other thing this really allows for, especially if you're using video games or uh, you know, console-based or computer-based, you can incorporate modifications and accommodations very easily. Uh, you know, a lot of times, especially before we started doing things like this, um, to modify the the content for students that needed, you know, even some, even things as simple as a larger text you had to plan way ahead and differentiation became something that could be very time consuming. Oftentimes making you want to stop doing things that you might 
otherwise be interested in doing. Utilization of gaming is something that allows you to have every student be supported with the time and the, the, the materials that they need in a way that is very easy to make accessible for everyone. There's other ones there too. Hit me up on Twitter. These are a couple of pictures from playing the game of life in my class. And an important, so I mentioned that my school is 100% immigrant population. The nature of that is that zero of my students are native English language speakers. They're all coming here and they need to learn English in order, and who are my New Yorkers? Right? So they, they unfortunately need to pass the stupid English readings exam in order to graduate, which for someone who does not, who does not speak English natively is a huge hurdle to graduation. Right? So we need to get them in four years to learn all the content and learn English enough to pass that test. And an important aspect of that is to get, getting them to actually speak to each other. Right? So I have students from like 20 to 30 different countries and getting them to play board games specifically. Video games are great, but like board games are really interested in talking to each other more. Right? So playing games like the game of life and getting them to actually talk to each other is phenomenal in getting them to start acquiring oral English. Um, pictures that aren't here, but I also started teaching, uh, when I, I did a unit on economic systems, and I paid, I, got, I, bought, I bought five boards of Monopoly, and I altered the rules depending on the, on the economic system that I wanted them to learn about. So I had a set of rules for capitalism, a set of rules for socialism, and a set of rules for communism, and they had to play and see how... Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, your liberal teacher agenda, making everyone a communist. It's okay. It's okay. I teach in New York City. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> All right. I will say that my students did not come out of this enjoying communism. They were like, that's a bunch of bullshit. Um, because it's not fun. There's literally, there's no money and there's no property. They just went around in circles for five minutes and were like, I'm done. Um, now it's good I didn't move. So. Let's move on. Yeah, so uh, the, the thing that's really great about games is they're fun. Uh, yeah, like yeah. we're we're talking about all this content and high level thinking, but like at the core of it, this is a fun activity and concept for students to do. Uh, I also had a lot of fun finding out all of these memes because they're hilarious. Because <laughs> I like memes. But we're gonna keep going. Really quickly, one of my behavior management things that I do with some of my classes is choose your own character, where they choose a character, fictional, non-fictional, whatever, um, and they choose abilities for them, and then they gain experience points. Those experience points go towards extra credit that they get on assessment, but in order to earn points, they have to complete mystery goals, which are usually behavior management strategies. So like, not curse Mr. L out at all this week, or come to class on time for at least four out of five times, or submit your homework. Doing those mystery things, which they don't know, they just have to be listening to all the policies and doing all that stuff, gives them the points and it's been working very well so far, so I'll probably be expanding into the future. But, now that you've been here for 43 minutes, no, 53 minutes, how exactly do you make this work for yourself? There's gonna be a lot of gifts. First off, you need to plan, plan, plan. All the examples we've given have background knowledge, have deeper thinking. We're not just playing games for poops and giggles. There's a purpose behind it. Especially when administrators are gonna say like, well, why are you playing a game instead of doing X, Y, and Z? If you can provide evidence or provide your rationale or your lesson plan, that's always going to be useful. Mm -hmm. Video games is just another context or another artifact that the students are gonna be using that is going to apply to whatever concept they need to be working on. Next is start small and expand gradually. You want to set realistic goals and time frames. And I like these three questions. Marianne put them in. What is the purpose? What are the limits? What are the resources? So you want to start gradually. Like what bad news bears for me. Well, one of my first major projects that I did, which was kind of forced on me, uh, heavily implied by one of my supervisors in the long distance task, um, was to do a two-week project that have students to teach themselves trade. It did not go over well. Hmm. So going from zero to two weeks of a major project, 
kind of burned me out and put me in a not great mood of like, okay, why would I do this again? But if you start with a warm-up activity that we've mentioned or something that you want to try for yourself and then build it out to maybe doing a one-day activity in the next quarter or doing a three-day activity next semester is going to help you and also help the students kind of get used to those kinds of expectations. Also, pair games with content areas that make sense. Don't try to shoehorn. Like, if we're playing Assassin's Creed, don't talk about parabolas, unless there's a purpose. Don't talk about completing the square. That's not really relevant. Um, and then something that Zach added was, how does gaming add that in? I don't remember adding that. Okay. <laughs> JK. Maybe I, I might have been <laughs> just, just say yes, thank you. <laughs> I am so brilliant. That's all you need to say. But anyway, like we said, like, if you're just putting a game in there for poops and giggles just because you feel like it and it's fun and you don't have a purpose behind it, yeah, that's fun, but like, if it's not serving a purpose, it's going to be detrimental for any activity you try doing in the future. I have a quick addition now that I'm thinking about it, but like, your students who don't write, who like games, are going to write about video games. Like, 100%. Your students who don't enjoy reading, if you give them articles or guides about video games, they're going to read. So just for any struggling writers and readers out there, who you know enjoy video games, give it to them and say that will add value to their education and their time there. They'll want to be there. Now the next two are gonna kind of pair with each other. Get feedback from students. See if they like it. Okay, keep going. And then the next one is reflective teaching. See if you liked it. <laughs> We have about five minutes, so we are going to look for a few questions here. Um, these are some ways you can get a hold of us, and we are always happy to talk about games and kids and games and kids together and other things, so don't be a stranger. What we'd really like is next year or two years from now, we'd like to be in the audience cheering you on as you teach games in your classroom, because that's how we make change is supporting you. That sounded like something a communist would say. <laughs> so we, we got questions that we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Okay, what's the best question? Um, Who's your favorite student in the class? Well, I can't read all of them that fast and thank you in advance, but I thought JC's from Dallas, Texas. How do you feel that virtual reality will influence classrooms moving forward? Hmm. How would you guys take that? Well, I'd just like to say that um, until we get a much bigger budget in my school, it won't. Yeah, that, was, that was the first thought I had as well. Was, I mean, yeah, I'd love to see the, the movie version, uh, you know, where everybody has their own headset and everything. But, I mean, years ago, uh, oh, man, I lost the, lost, the, lost the thought. It was um, one of the computer-based I lost it. They, they have a little cardboard, it, it wasn't Google, but they have a little cardboard VR set that you could, Nearpod, it was Nearpod that you could use, and they had, their, they had little uh, VR, VR cardboard sets that you could put a phone in. And I went to my administration and you know, said, hey, I do this, this is awesome, I can take them on virtual tours of the world, and they were like, yeah, it is awesome. But we're public school teachers. Right. I mean, there are some virtual tours for museums. Those kinds of things have been really helpful in COVID when everybody is at home. But it's going to be a while, I think, before we are going to be able to commit resources to that, unfortunately. We'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. Another question I think was wonderful. They're all wonderful, but we can't get to all of them. Is Melissa from New Hampshire. Yes. What do you say to people that don't think kids should be playing games in school? Why did they play Candy Crush so much on their own and Stardew Valley on their own phones? No. I guess it really depends on who the person is. Uh, but if it's an administrator, show them this panel. I mean, we, that, and the other part of it is they're, 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 this is results based. You know, we, we have Zach who has not only the planning written, but the, the other side of it, the results, the, you know, the, the work has been done, Mary getting her PhD and this stuff. Like there's, and beyond just us, there's plenty out there to support why games in the classroom are needed. Not just that they're fun, not that just, just that they're engaging, but that there are populations of kids 
who need this in order to really reach their full potential. You know, when I first started, it, 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 you heard all the, all the time about, you know, we can't let any of the kids slip through the cracks. Do this, and none of them will. And we're completely, like, if you are a teacher who starts to come up against this or is afraid that they're going to, reach out to us because we've been there and we're happy to help you think that through. Yeah, and collaboration is always a good thing. Like I said before, it's not a bad thing to keep learning, like, yeah. or collaborate, or falter, or make mistakes. Like I said before, just trying to do something is better than not doing anything. So we are out of time, but we want to first off thank everyone for coming. And real quick, now that you trust us, can I ask a favor? Yes. Today is my son's 11th birthday. He couldn't be here, and I would love it if I could take a video of all of you on the count of three saying happy birthday, Ben. Did you guys do that for me? Do you want me to count them in? What? Do you want me to count them in? Are we going to do it like the jumping? Probably. <laughs> Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday! Thank you guys so much. You've been wonderful comrades. <laughs> Have a great patch, everyone. Enjoy.